Okay, our next talk by Hiro Asani, A Brief History of Time for Rubyists. Thank you. Before I get started, uh, I would like to ask you a favor. This is. Yes? We don't know where your bag is, so don't ask. Uh, yes, I'd like you to find my bag. Um, Alright, it's Friday. And it means one thing for us. Friday. Uh, my friends. Is to stand up. Everyone, please stand up. I've never done this before because uh, many of you gave a talk on Friday. But, um, this person uh, is known as Pendala. Uh, his real name is Aaron Patterson. He does a lot of things for us Rubyists. Uh, he does a lot of work on Rails uh, for things like uh, performance improvements for active records. Things that are really, really hairy and scary things. But one thing he does best is to get you guys involved in community spirit. And Friday, he declares making it to Friday, and he uh, posts his photo of giving a air hug to you. And I would like you to do the same uh, for Tendo Love, uh, Aaron Patterson. Okay, I am going to take a photo from here. And spread your arms like this. Okay, and uh, I am going to take a photo of you guys. One, two, three. Do it again. Do it again. One, two, three. Yay! Yay! Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. 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 My name is Hiro. I work for a company called Travis CI from Berlin. Uh, we make continuous inter integration uh, software and service for Travis. And I have stickers, so if you want them, please come see me after the talk. I'm going to talk about time and other stuff. Keeping track of time and figuring out what happened before this moment right now, and what is going to happen in the future, is a very important aspect of human nature. That is one of the um, basic things that differentiates humans from other animals. You can see the sun in the sky, and it rises from the east, goes high up in the sky in the south. If you're in the sun, uh, northern hemisphere, that's where the civilization started, so I'm going to focus on the northern hemisphere. Sorry, Phil. <laughs> and it sets in the west. It happens day after day after day. But humans realize that, that the trajectory doesn't stay the same. It goes low in uh, winter and high above in the summer. This is a picture uh, taken by a technique called solarography. Uh, it's a pinhole camera set against a photosensitive paper. And this one probably is about 20 days of exposure in the sky. You can see the sun taking the um, trajectory and then gradually moving up in the sky. The breaks in the light uh, corresponds to clouds. Right? Monuments like Stonehenge is uh, believed to mark these seasons year after year. So it's not a very sophisticated idea, but it's an old one and a fundamental one. Today is March 27th, uh, 2015. If you're from the United States, or 27th of March, uh, 2015, if you are from the uh, British English speaking countries like New Zealand and I don't know uh, what you guys use here. 
American. American. But as programmers, you probably want to think of it as 2015-03-27. Of course, the sun is not the only celestial body that you can observe. Right? The moon is another familiar one. And often, you can see that the days and nights go faster for the moon phases to change and make a complete cycle from the new moon to half moon to full moon and then back to half and then to new. There are calendars based on the lunar cycles instead. For example, Islamic one, it will be 7th of Jumada al Qadir, uh, 1430s. 1436th year after uh, Hijra. Did I say it right? I, I hope I did. And if you are a Hebrew uh, calendar, this is 7th of the month of Nisan, uh, 5775. But I'm going to talk about the sun because that is the um, most commonly used calendar today. Egyptians, as early as 1500 BC, is credited for dividing the daylight into 12 parts. Right? The reason that 12 is chosen is not clear. One belief is that there are 12 lunar cycles within a solar year. Okay? That's one. Uh, another is that you can count 12 with one hand because there are three joints in each finger, right? So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and eleven, twelve. <laughs> one good thing about uh, twelve is that it's easy to divide, right? You can divide by two evenly, uh, by three and four. Okay? So there's one good thing about twelve. It, it doesn't have to be divisible by ten. You can see this um, old sundial. If you imagine a, a gnomon sticking out, the shadow of the gnomon will move from the right hand side to down to the bottom and to the left as the sun moves from the east to south to west. Right? That's how the word clockwise comes in. If the civilization started in the southern hemisphere, things will be different. Here we have a sundial from Perth. And you can see that the numbers are going from left to bottom to right. And that is the uh, correct uh, clockwise for the southern hemisphere. But civilization didn't start there. Where did, so that's where the 12 hours of the day and 12 hours of the night, because the yes, Egyptians also divided the night into 12 parts. 12, 24 hours in a day. But how did we come up with 60 minutes in an hour, 60 seconds in a minute? The Greeks uh, knew that the, the Earth is round, right? 500 BC. Um, they knew it, and the mathematician named Aristophanes divided the Earth's circle into 60 parts. Why 60? Because they were under the influence of Babylonians. Babylonians had a hexadecimal numbering system. Why 60? We don't know, but 60 they did. And one good thing about 60 is that the, it is divisible by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. It's very easy to divide things. Right? So that's one theory about number 60. So Aristophanes divided the, uh, the world into 60 parts. And then later on, Hipparchus came along and divided the circle into 360 parts. I do not know why, but they did. Uh, uh, he did. That's why we have 360 degrees in a circle. His father 
divided by the one degree arc into 60 parts. Because, well, 60 is the base of all the numbering systems for the public monument. The first part is named Partus Minutae Primae. Okay? It means first small parts. The first small 60 parts. Right? And then one part in Minutai Primai was thought divided into 60 partes Minutai Secundae. Secundae, sorry. That's how we end up with a minute and a second. 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour, 24 hours in a day. Right? That's very simple. All right, so let's get back to the calendar. Egyptians really, really love their calendar. And this is inherited by the Romans, who came up with the first uh, calendar uh, by Romulus, the legendary founder of the city of Rome. Their calendar had 10 months, either 31 days or 30 days, and those Days are distributed that way. Started with March, April, May, June, the fifth month, Quintilis, uh, six months, Sextilis, sextil, sextil, uh, September, October, November, December. Uh, that's seventh, eighth, ninth, and tenth month of the year. Their year had 304 days and a whole lot of winter days after December. They didn't really care about those months. Uh, but that's how it was. And then there was a reform by Numa Pompilis around 313 BC. He had two months out of the dark days, uh, Januaris and Februaris. Uh, 29 and 28 days um, because Romans loved the odd numbers. They were luckier than even ones. Here we have a old Roman calendar. It's a little difficult to see, but the uh, the first month on the upper left corner is clearly Martius, March, and the last one is February, meaning that their year started in March. Right? That corresponded to the vernal equinox. The spring is the start of the year. This changed at some point between 700 BC to the first century BC, so that the start of the year changed to January. I don't know why. That's basically end up with the months that we have today. Still, we have 355 days, which is way shorter than the solar year of 365 days. And then this guy came along, Julius Caesar, and as oh gosh, he was a leader of the Senate. Uh, I can't remember the title, but he reformed the calendar so that the days are distributed in the way that we are familiar today, and the leap year is inserted every four years into February. All right. So that's very familiar, but there's a problem. Because the solar year is shorter than 365.25 days that Julius gave us. Everyone knew about this, but did nothing about it. Imagine that. So by the time this guy, uh, Pope uh, Gregorius Gregory the 13th came along in the um, 16th century, things were so bad for the Catholic Church. Catholic Church wanted Easter to happen around the time that vernal equinox happened, but the difference just drifted, drifted, and drifted over time, and the church had to do something, and he came up with an idea, and that is to change the dates that leap year happens. The leap year is inserted every four years, 
except for the multiple of 100, except for the multiple of 400. Right? So that's why we had the leap year in the year 2000, if you remember. I hope you all remember. Yes, you're all, you're all old enough to remember. This will give us the solar year of 365.2425 days, which is very good because by observation, it is more something like 365.242374 and so on. Very good. The difference is there, but we can probably deal with it. In the meantime, the timekeeping devices kept increasing, not improving. Excuse me. Here we have put Cedra, the water clock. It will drip the water from the cylinder in the middle to the wheel, which will move the cylinder on the right-hand side, and the guy, the figurine at the top, will point to the time of the day. This is considered very accurate at the time until uh, other devices came along to replace it. It was small enough for any household to have. Other devices include a candle. As the candle burns, you can see how much time has elapsed. Right? People did that. In the 14th century, mechanical clocks came. First powered by pen, pen ones. Pen ones. And then after that, with mainstream. And we still use that today. Up until this time, every town had their own time. People didn't move fast enough to really care about them. The town here in London, for example, had their own time. A uh, town in, uh, let's say, Liverpool had their own clock. Because church decided, you know, uh, the moon, uh, no, not moon, the sun is in the middle of the sky, so it must be the noon. And it, it's going to ring the bell to uh, mark noon. The Industrial Revolution changed all of that. People started moving faster, faster, and faster, and railroad companies could not operate if you have to change time every single time you stop at a train station. Right? So you have to do something. Here you can see the time differences between uh, among many U.S. cities. When Washington D.C. is at noon, you can see Uh, you can see that various cities have different times. So, engineer, um, a Scottish Canadian engineer named Sandford Fleming came up with an idea to call for a conference to make, make things change. He called for a conference in Washington, D.C. in 1884, International Meridian Conference, to talk about this. That, at that conference, it was decided that the Earth, or is it the globe, is going to be divided into 24 uh, strips according to the meridian from 0 to 15 to 30 eastward and westward. It was further decided that the zero prime meridian goes through the Greenwich Observatory in London. And the time zone will be centered around those uh, meridians that I just described. Zero, 15, 13, and so on. We end up with the time zones like this today uh, for political and economical reasons. And the, uh, the history of the international dateline is curious and interesting, but probably for another uh, topic of another talk. Yeah. 
So remember, we talked about what a second is, right? A second is a, a fraction, 1 over 86,400 of one day. Okay, this is a very naive definition, it turns out, because the length of the day, uh, typically um, measured from the time the sun is in the due north south to the next time the sun comes to the due south, right? That is not always the same. This is a problem if you want to be a precise scientific society. In the 1960s, there was a brief period of time that the second was this defined that way. <laughs> I don't know what that means. Some fraction of some um, solar time of some imaginary day. This was a problem, as I said, and scientists came up with the atomic clock. In this clock, cesium-133 is uh, excited and the laser beam is uh, uh, what's the right word? You, you fire. 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 <laughs> fire the laser beam towards the, uh, the uh, cesium-133 atom and calculate how many times the, uh, the atom uh, gets excited to different, different states. And this is the definition of a second that we have today. Nine trillion, 192 billion, 600, no, wait, 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 that's not right. Nine billion, sorry. Nine, just about 9.2 billion uh, periods of uh, uh, excitement of the uh, one, uh, cesium-133 atom. Great. Today, you can have a uh, chip size about this big, chip size atomic clock for 1500 US dollars. That's incredible. <laughs> My physicist friend tells me that there are far better accurate um, clock than this, or a little cheaper, but um, the definition of the second is still the cesium. This brings us to the difference between UTC, Coordinated Universal Time, CUT. <laughs> the reason that we have UTC instead of CUT is that the English and the French cannot agree on anything. Just like international uh, scientific units of OSI, right? The UTC is the time defined by the UT um, SI second that I just talked about, right? The atomic clock ticking. I mean, it's going to tick, and it will give you time. Greenwich mean time is mean time. <laughs> it's a time based on observation. At the Greenwich Observatory, the sun hits the due north, and you keep time that way. There will be differences. Right? So the time based on the observation is called UT1. It is going to keep the time, um, as I said, uh, what is the sun's position in the sky at the Greenwich uh, Observatory. As, sorry. In general, the Earth orbit around the Sun is slowing down, in general. Okay? It can be faster in certain events, but it's very, very rare. Over time, the UTC and UT1 will drift apart. And if it drifts too far apart, it is not good for the science, scientific reasons. And when that happens, it was decided to inject leap seconds at a certain time of the year. This will keep 
the UTC and UT1, the observation based time definition, within one second. Up to 2015, we have had 26 of them. And there will be another one at the end of June of this year. And here, the plot shows the difference between UT1 and UTC over the last uh, 40 some years. Oh, wait. 30 years. Okay, so that's good, right? That's the basic overview of what time and calendar is in this society right now. The Gregorian calendar and the time based on the um, atomic clock. How does computer today keep track of all of that? Right? How? There's a database called PC data, and it is often called Olsen database by uh, name by after, after the first person who came up with this idea to keep track of time zone data over time. Because time zone changes, as I said before, and it's really, really confusing. No one knows everything, right? And it is now managed by ICAM. I can't remember what ICAM stands for, I apologize. It is now maintained by UCLA lecturer Paul Eggert, and it is released several times a year, about 10 times uh, most of the year, and the most current version is 2015B. And it, the source code is available at GitHub. So if you want to keep your Unix-like computer up, most up to date with this data, you can do that. Basically, um, get the uh, repository, extract it, and use a command called VIC, Zone Info File. I can give you the uh, just later on, and you don't have to write that at all. In Ruby world, there is a gem called DZ Info that does this for you. And to date, uh, it has seen 45 million downloads, one of the most prolific um, gems of all time, mostly due to Rails using it. <laughs> because Rails doesn't want to deal with time zones either. Okay, so for one computer on your machine, on your computer, PC data will keep you up to date. What about distributed systems? It's a little difficult. That's where network time protocol comes in. That picture is a um, Mayan glyph of something. I don't know what it is. <laughs> NTP starts out with a reference box, um, most accurate and definition of the time. Reference plots will have clients to which, uh, sorry, which will set their time according to the NTP with the reference plot. Reference plots are very exclusive in that no one else uh, can touch it, but the clients of the reference box uh, called the ser servers in straight one can have more and more um, clients in that way. In this picture, clients, your machines, are connected to strat straight three machines, but it doesn't have to be that way. It can connect to uh, straight two or one if you have access to them. There's nothing really stopping you. So how does an NTP work? Client is going to send an NTP packet with a timestamp C0. Server gets it and puts its own timestamp S0, processes it, 
and as another timestamp, S1, sends it back to the client, and the client will end up with another timestamp, C1. And if you assume, which is a good assumption, if you assume that the network condition from client to server and from server to client are similar or identical in ideal situations, you can see that the latency between the two servers will be given by that simple fraction. Right? So if you go back, if you set the, the client's time to the server's timestamp S1 plus that, that network latency at the end of the transaction, your client's time, or the client's plot time, it will be synchronized with that of server, right? Okay. The client will do this a few times. I think the eight times is the uh, the default in most cases sufficient. This will give you a confidence interval of how, what time it really is. Right? It's a statistical, statistical jargon that I'm going into. But it will give you an idea of what time it really should be. The client will do this with many other NTP servers because, well, NTP, that server might not be the best one. Right, so you want to you have this different opinions, as it were, of what time it really is. You collect these confidence intervals and use a sophisticated statistical algorithm to choose the one best one. And you set the time accordingly. And here we have a demo of that uh, process. It's a little difficult to see, but uh, let me explain what this shows. Here is a list of NTP servers that we're going to um, address. This is the offset uh, that we're going to uh, use. And uh, it's a little difficult to see, but um, how many packets has been exchanged with this server and so on. Over time, the server will be sorted according to the best one. And the green one, this one, it is 0.pool1.ntp.org was chosen to be the best one, and the uh, offset is uh, shown that way. All right. So if you look at the uh, servers, uh, server name like time.apple.com, if you have an Apple computer. Um, if you go to the date and time setting, settings preference down, you will see the, the time server um, probably the default being time.apple.com. And that name resolves to many, many um, servers because you want multiple servers assigned to get your uh, time correct. Okay, so what about Ruby? Find it. There's time class that is uh, built in and available at all times. And time is not exactly the right word for it because it knows about date and time zone and daylight savings time. It has methods like Monday, question mark. I took this uh, earlier this week and uh, I think that's true. <laughs> it was true at the time. It still is. And you can ask, is it Tuesday? Is it UTC? Give me the UTC time corresponding to that time. You notice that in the, uh, the first line, we have the time of offset 0, 4, 0, 0. That means I was in Eastern Daylight Time in the United States. And you can see that you can ask for time zone information, even though it is really time. And you can, you can even ask, is it daylight savings time? There is a standard library named time, which will extend the time class and add these methods. 
uh, HTTP date, which corresponds to Apache timestamp, and ISO 8601, which will give you 2107-403-27, and so on. Um, other formats include RFC 2822 and RFC 822, and then uh, conversion functions like to date, to date time, which brings me to the next classes, date and date time, which are introduced to your program by required date, which is done implicitly if you do required time. You can see from the second uh, example that time and date time are not com comparable. But you can use the uh, conversion function to date time that, that I showed earlier. You can uh, do the calculation between the two. The date class has a class method called JD. And that will let you convert from the Julian calendar to the Gregorian. There is an interesting uh, uh, constant named date dot dot Italy that marks the first day of Gregorian calendar. It's a, it's really a, um, an integer. I can't remember the value, but if you pass it to JD. Um, method, it will give you the date, date, uh, yes, date object uh, that corresponds to the first day of Gregorian calendar. We talked about how the, there was a discrepancy between the Julian calendar and the Gregorian, right? If you remember, if you took note, note at the time, the first day of Gregorian calendar was October 15th of 1582. If you go back one more day, you will end up is 1582-1004, because that was the difference between the Julian calendar and the Gregorian calendar at the time. So if you see something from 1582, uh, October, uh, let's say, 07, you might be uh, in for some treat. All right, finally, let's look at the uh, leap second uh, for these uh, classes. Time.parse will give you that uh, object from the re string representation. And if you go into, if you remember, if you remember uh, the uh, last year, there was only second, but Ruby does not know that apparently. If you, 60 is a valid value for the second, but if you feed it, the valid leap second, it will give you the same time. That should not be happening. And also, date time has that problem, but this time, the error is rounded down to 50, 59, 59, instead of, instead of going to the next day. So, if you try to compare the two, which should be the same according to the leap second uh, definition is not in Ruby. I don't know what to say about that. This really concludes my talk. But remember, if you're a programmer, always use UTC. It is not Greenwich Mean Time because it's not. Thank you.